on this Friday night, tracking Hurricane Lane, the slow moving heavy storm that's been hitting Hawaii hard. We'll show you the damage and the frayed nerves caused by huge rains and flooding. And we'll catch up with Canadians caught in what's usually a weather paradise. A shocking change for a place that's almost never hit like this. Also tonight, more troubling news for the U.S. president as the immunity deals for his inner circle keep coming. This time, it's the top financial executive of the Trump organization bringing investigators closer to its core. As the saying goes, follow the money. This is The National. A storm like this is a very rare thing in Hawaii, but this is what people woke up to on the Big Island today. Some areas there have already seen almost a meter of rainfall, which is an incredible amount of water. Take a look. This is Rainbow Falls near the town of Hilo a couple of days ago. And this is what it looks like now. People in some of the hardest hit neighborhoods have already been told to get out before it's too late. Lane is causing intense flash flooding and landslides, and conditions are expected to get worse as the night goes on. This is a live shot of Honolulu, which is six hours behind Eastern time, so there's still quite a bit of daylight left, and you can see how rough the water looks. Lane now passing dangerously close. And just to give you an idea of how enormous this storm really is, take a look at this. This is what Lane looked like this morning as a Category 3 hurricane. Now, fortunately, it's been getting weaker, downgrading in strength. But make no mistake, it is still packing a punch. Some parts of Hawaii could see winds up to 140 kilometers an hour, storm surges more than a meter above normal tides, and, of course, more torrential rain. Officials are telling people to shelter in place tonight. And as Anita Bath explains, that includes thousands of tourists, including Canadians. <laughs> For Canadians hunkered down in Hawaii, it's a waiting game. There's just debris everywhere for now, and this is just the start. British Columbian Jackson Schaefer has stocked up on supplies. We have about four flats of water. Our neighbors that left gave us all of the food they had, which was very generous of them, and our bathtubs are filled with water. Long lines at grocery stores are the norm as everyone preps. There was hardly any bread there, and there, it looked like they were getting low on water, but people were definitely stocking up. The Smith family from Alberta goes to bed waiting each night for the storm to hit. We're getting impatient now, but <laughs> more than anything, but yeah, a little bit concerned. I mean, we've never gone through a hurricane before. There are nearly 300,000 tourists currently visiting the state. Flights back to Canada have been cancelled until at least tomorrow. It's mostly, you know, the wind and the rain and the high volumes of this that um, we, we do want to avoid. WestJet and Air Canada had recovery flights yesterday, bringing back as many people as possible. They called us around 6.30 in the evening last night to say, listen, we have this special flight that we're laying on. Can you be at the airport in about two hours? Rob Cottingham and his family scrambled, wrapping up the boxes of supplies they bought days before. Cooling towel. Uh, food, little hot pot. And as the plane took off, uh, we passed through a layer of something. Don't know if it was heavy rain or hail, but there was a lot of thumping on the outside of the aircraft. Cottingham is happy to be safe. Not everyone is so lucky. The lights have been flickering a bit, but we still have power. I've heard that there's areas around us that have lost power completely, uh, and they're still trying to get that back. In the meantime, it's watch and see. Residents and travelers alike hoping this is the worst of it. Anita Bath, CBC News, Vancouver. Now, one Hawaii resident has been shooting and posting videos of the scene where he lives. We reached out, and he's tonight's witness. Hey, guys, this is uh, Jonathan Correa from Hilo, Hawaii. Uh, just started raining again. This is the Wailuku River. Uh, currently standing on the Singing Bridge, which is what we call it here in Hilo. It leads uh, to the Hamakua coast over there. What motivated me to take the drone footage? Pretty much, um, you know, there wasn't a lot of people down there at the time. And, um, I mean, we are tourist-driven with the lava that's happened and the past floods in Kauai. Um, you know, I think it's kind of been rough for us, so just just to get something out there and, and you know, let the news agencies take it and share it. Um, maybe to just give us some exposure, um, 
awesome. You know, it is a beautiful place. And uh, like my dad, Hank, has always said, um, you don't get lush, um, you know, look at this, trees everywhere. You can't get lush paradise without a little bit of rain. Wow, but uh, okay, a lot of rain uh, is what we've been seeing. So meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff, you, you've been tracking this storm for us. Can you walk us through the next 24 hours? Well, Andrew, Lane is continuing to weaken, but that'll do l little to lessen the impact of the rain on the islands. In fact, as the storm gets torn apart, it's actually slowing it down. So actually enhancing those rainfall totals, colossal flooding, not out of the question as it makes its closest approach to the islands overnight into Saturday morning. And there's so much uncertainty in the track, a landfall still can't be ruled out, Andrew, in the next few hours. Okay, and Joe, how, how ready were people for a storm of this magnitude? Well, we've, we've been watching this storm for well over a week, and officials have been preparing the, island, the islands for a marathon event. Hawaii is a place that knows natural disasters, volcanoes, earthquakes, storms, and they're so isolated, people are prepared to be without food or water for several days. Despite that, this is an unprecedented storm. We've only had a handful this strong come this close to the islands. And as I've said, with such an unusual track, it's so hard to nail down that final forecast. Really, anything could happen in the next few hours. Okay. Johanna Wagstaff, thanks for this. You're welcome. Okay, here's what else we're working on tonight on The National. As Maxime Bernier gives his first interview since announcing his intention to start a new political party, Catherine Cullen takes us to the Conservative Convention in Halifax, where unity is the magic word. And it's a special day for the people of Humboldt. Lord Stanley's Cup makes a special stop in a town that is still healing from April's tragedy. But first, another Donald Trump confidant opens up to federal investigators. The latest in an eventful week for all the president's men. Two former members of Trump's inner circle crash and burn in federal court, while two other close personal associates take deals to save themselves. Here's how the week unfolded. Tuesday, Paul Manafort was convicted on eight counts, all financial crimes. And within minutes, Michael Cohen pleaded guilty to eight criminal charges of his own. Yesterday, we learned that Trump's longtime friend and business ally, National Enquirer publisher David Pecker, took an immunity deal to share what he knows. And today, we learned that Alan Weisselberg, the Trump Organization's longtime chief financial officer, did the same, bringing investigators right inside the president's business. Weisselberg is considered by many to be the ultimate Trump insider, privy to the innermost workings of Trump's businesses. If there are dodgy dealings, he'd know about them. Now, it's not clear what Weisselberg has agreed to in return for immunity, but the deal's making a lot of Trump loyalists very nervous. Keith Bogue joins us now. Keith, this is not a small thing. Andrew... You know, for months now, we've heard that when it comes to Donald Trump's business dealings, the guy who knows where all the bodies are buried is his former lawyer and fixer, Michael Cohen. The same Michael Cohen who was convicted this week of tax fraud, bank fraud, and campaign finance violations. But the truth is that it's really Alan Weisselberg who knows more about the Trump business than anyone in the world not actually named Trump. Replacing George this week is my chief financial officer, Alan Weisselberg. Back in his reality TV days, Trump would sometimes invite Alan Weisselberg to his show, The Apprentice, to be a judge. He's never had much of a speaking part in the greater scheme of things, but he has, for many years, been the most senior executive in the Trump organization, other than members of Trump's family. He started out as an accountant for the company when it was owned by the president's father, Fred Trump, in the 1970s. Now, he's not only the chief financial officer, but one of just two trustees of the Trump organization, and the other is Donald Trump Jr. When it comes time for the financing, which will be... Listen, what financing? We'll have to pay you. So I'll pay again. No, 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 no. I got... No, no, no. His name comes up in this tape-recorded conversation between Michael Cohen and the president as they discuss what is apparently a hush money payment to a woman who claims to have had an affair with Trump. That's what led in part to Cohen's conviction this week. And I've spoken to Alan Weisselberg about how to set the whole thing up. Weisselberg's immunity deal was reportedly triggered by his cooperation in the Cohen investigation, but he could have much more to talk about with investigators than just that, Andrew. 
Right. And so, Keith, talk to me about the scope of the immunity. Does it protect Weisselberg from prosecution for all crimes he might have been involved with? Well, we don't know because we don't know the details of the immunity agreement. It's possible he could have immunity for any crimes he has knowledge of. And in that case, it would be a tremendous incentive for him to tell everything, to answer questions he hasn't even been asked. What we do know is that giving immunity to Weisselberg means that investigators are more interested in what he knows about other people than they are in putting him in jail. Hmm. But, but if not Weisselberg, then, then who might they be really interested in? Okay, again, we don't know, but it wouldn't make sense for investigators to give Weisselberg immunity so they can go after smaller fish. They must want bigger fish, and the obvious bigger fish are the Trump family and the president himself. Keith Bogue in Washington, thanks very much. Thank you. We have an update to share with you tonight on the health of one of the U.S. president's most vocal critics, 81-year-old Republican Senator John McCain. He's been battling an aggressive form of brain cancer for more than a year now and has been away from Washington since December. Well, in a statement, his family wrote, John has surpassed expectations for his survival, but the progress of disease and the inexorable advance of age render their verdict. With his usual strength of will, he has now chosen to discontinue medical treatment. They went on to thank McCain's caregivers and his many supporters. Well, politics in this country have been dominated by Maxime Bernier's sudden break from the Conservative Party yesterday on the eve of its national convention. Well, today, Bernier took his pitch to power in politics, Vashi Capellos. I'm saying to conservatives, if you want to win the next election, if you want to win with real conservative ideas, come and join us, be with us. But also, not only conservative, 20% of the population didn't vote at the last election. People were fed up and they don't, they don't vote. So these people, I'm telling to them, you know, I'm doing politics differently. Conservative leader Andrew Scheer, on the other hand, is looking to take back the spotlight tonight and put Bernier behind him. But that's maybe easier said than done. Catherine Cullen takes us to the convention floor, where Shears, once again rival, still looms large. And by the way, that little weather system that passed over here yesterday, it has gone. That hurricane has left the building. That would be Hurricane Max, and the Conservatives are trying to blow him off as quickly as they can. It's time to move forward. What happened, happened, and uh, hoping for the, you know, uh, glory days for our Conservative Party. It's a tough situation. We wish Mr. Bernier well. However, I think now is the time that we need to be unified as a party and to go forward. Do you think he represents a threat to the Conservative Party of Canada? I don't believe so. But not everyone here is so quick to dismiss Maxim Bernier. Already at odds with the party over not being able to run in the next election, former cabinet minister Stephen Fletcher points to the leadership results as a sign Bernier's support runs deep. Uh, Maxime uh, has a lot of credibility when he speaks about the issues that he raises because those are issues that affect Canadians uh, in every case. <laughs> But when Andrew Scheer spoke to conservative faithful tonight, Bernier's name didn't come up once in a 55-minute long speech. We certainly are one big, strong, united, national conservative party. He did, however, address some of the topics Bernier has glommed on to, like the city of Victoria's decision to remove a statue of conservative prime minister Sir John A. Macdonald. Scheer raised Liberal Prime Minister Mackenzie King's attitude towards Jewish refugees fleeing Nazi Germany. Will the Liberals work to take his face off the $50 bill? No. But you can see how divisive this approach is, how destructive this is to our Canadian identity. All while Bernier looks for a name for his new party and even says he could become Prime Minister next year. As inspiration, the man too conservative for the Conservatives cites former socialist Emmanuel Macron. He decided to quit the party and forming his own party as now he's a president of France. So everything is possible. Everything is possible with ideas. I'm not popular. Ideas are popular. The Conservatives are certainly hoping Bernier isn't popular and that they can keep the focus on their ideas and turn the page on this fight. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Halifax. 
Well, the most coveted trophy in Canada arrived in Humboldt, Saskatchewan today, fulfilling a promise by a Saskatoon-born hockey hero. You can touch it if you want. <laughs> That's a dream come true, right? Chandler Stevenson plays for the Washington Capitals and swore to bring the Stanley Cup to Humboldt if his team won the championship back in the spring. Today, he made good. Stevenson played junior hockey in Saskatchewan before joining the Caps and once played alongside Caleb Dahlgren and Braden Kamrud, both of whom survived that terrible crash back in April. Now, the Cup being there means a lot to folks in Humboldt. Our Olivia Stefanovic has more on how the town is healing, how the team is rebuilding, and how a coach's widow is coping. It's every hockey fan's dream to meet NHLers and see the Sacred Cup. But Canadians everywhere can agree that this stop this summer is special. I really believe that they want to go out and uh, play hockey, play their hearts out for uh, for everybody that uh, was 29. And I think it's, it's something that just is really, really important to the youth in our community. More than 15 NHLers are kicking off the Humble Broncos training camp. While a fresh sheet of ice is laid for the new roster, old values instilled by former head coach Darcy Hogan remain. He would take a less skilled player over a quality kid, a community-minded, with good attitude, all that stuff. He would take that any day over the most skilled player that didn't have those attributes, right? Darcy was one of 16 killed in April's team bus crash with a semi-trailer on the way to a playoff game. People have said over and over what an incredible group of kids was on that bus. Like every single kid on that bus was an incredible human being um, because that was the culture that he designed and he expected. He and his wife Christina poured all their energy into the Broncos. That's how we would stand, like authoritative, like... Yeah. He was a very quiet coach. He did not say much. He always believed that you did your coaching during practice and during once the game started, you let them play. Now Christina has decided to step back from her role as office manager with the team and watch the game from the stands. It's so different this year to start with and then just having Darcy not be a part of it when he ran it and I was running the office and doing that, we were both very, very involved. The new players and coaches have a lot of work to do to prepare for the season opener. Um, once September 12 hits, then it's go time. But Darcy's core covenant has been painted on the walls of the Elgar Peterson Arena, immortalized. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Humboldt, Saskatchewan. And let's catch you up on some of the other stories we're tracking live tonight. Starting with a Coast Guard operation underway in Canada's north, it's deployed crews to help a cruise ship that ran aground in Nunavut. According to the Coast Guard, it happened near the community of Kugaruk. The ship involved is operated by the company One Ocean Expeditions, and it has a capacity of 161 people. Now, we don't know exactly how many people are actually on board, but the company says all passengers are safe and the ship itself is reportedly in okay shape. Two icebreakers are en route. The U.S.-Mexican issues inside NAFTA are really complicated. We welcome the fact that the U.S. and Mexico are rolling up their sleeves and devoting a lot of time to resolving those issues. That's a good thing for the U.S. and Mexico, and it's a good thing for Canada. Canada's Foreign Affairs Minister with some reassuring words. She says Canada will be back at the NAFTA negotiating table after the U.S. and Mexico sort out their differences and that the U.S. and Mexico are still committed to a three-way deal that includes Canada. And still ahead on The National, check out what happens when one of the world's most popular gun makers designs an electric car. Chris Brown shows us Kalashnikov's answer to Tesla. Plus, why all blood could be universal type O negative in a few years. We'll take you inside the scientific advances that are changing the donation game and staying behind to fight the fires. Karen Pauls goes inside the evacuation zone in BC. I am worried about my community. It's a, it is a big fire. It's scary.
It was big before, but the Alkali Lake fire near Telegraph Creek in British Columbia is now a monster. It's merged with three smaller wildfires, swelling to more than 1,100 square kilometers in the process. That makes it one of the biggest fires in the entire province. But northwest of there, right smack in the middle of BC, another inferno rages at Shovel Lake. Thousands of people have fled, but some have defied evacuation orders, risking their lives to protect their homes. Karen Pauls is there. My house is just below the mountain there, um, behind that church steeple. Miranda Louie is one of the people who have stayed behind despite an evacuation order to help protect homes from the Shovel Lake fire. Pretty worried, but um, you know, I have a lot of faith in our firefighters. Water trucks stop to fill up in the river before heading back to the front lines. Louis says their traditional territory is being ravaged by flames. Because that's our food. That's our um, way. That's that's the way we feed our families throughout the winter, and it's all being burned right now. If it looks bad from the ground, it's even worse from the air. Crews are trying to save about 150 homes on the north shore of Fraser Lake. You can see flames as close as 200 meters from the houses. We have 300 people on this particular fire and 130 pieces of equipment. Crews have burned fire guards to deprive the fire of fuel. Get people back to their houses. That's our biggest goal is to get people back in. I think we're winning more than we're losing. Grand Chief Edward John is here to see the damage. He says more needs to be done to plan ahead and prevent fires and to protect communities when they happen. First Nations make up 55% of the Canadian population. At least 50% of all evacuees from disasters are Aboriginal peoples, First Nations people. So we we're impacted in a, in a lot greater way than many other people. This is the second year in a row of devastating wildfires. It's why Noel Ketlow stayed behind to fight it. I am, I am worried about my community. It's a, it is a big fire. It's scary. You know, I mean, we have elders and children that are, that are gone to safer places. As the day ends, tired firefighters return to camp for dinner. It's been a long day, and we'll be back at it again tomorrow. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Nodley with 10 First Nation, BC. Now we are also keeping an eye on an American wildfire that has people in Canada on alert. The fire in Montana's Glacier National Park is fast growing and out of control. And right across the border is Alberta's Waterton Lakes National Park. We just want people to be prepared, have a bag ready with the essentials in case we do have to ask them to leave. Parks Canada deployed helicopters and fire crews today, just in case. And next on The National, a story of two sisters orphaned and separated by revolution. Their emotional fight to be reunited in our special CBC short doc. Plus, you know his voice. Hi, I'm Robin Leach, your host on romps to palatial playgrounds around the world. From local landmarks to the world's most lavish estates, you'll see it all. Robin Leach forever changed celebrity journalism when he took his viewers inside the lifestyles of the rich and famous. We'll take a closer look at his legacy just ahead. Our short doc tonight tells the story of two sisters and a bond that is unshakable. Vika and Irina have been separated for four years. They were orphaned during the Ukrainian Revolution. Ten-year-old Irina was adopted by a family in Canada. Vika had to stay behind at a rural boarding school. And now, at 17, she's about to strike out on her own. Their ultimate goal is to be reunited in Canada. But before Vika can move, she has to navigate a difficult life in Ukraine. Here's a look at an extraordinary long-distance relationship. Yes, 
Я слышала его вот недавно, этим летом, когда была в Карпатах, я его не знаю. Мы в школе каждый божий день, каждое божье утро поем гимканат. Серьезно? Это как гимн Украины мы поем. А какой гимн Украины? Да давай потом. Я тогда за тебя спою гимнканаду. Давай. Супер. У меня голос ужасный. У меня тоже, в принципе, мы, наверное, родственники. Я тоже так пою. Я Тяжко вычувати, когда ты чуешь, что в тебе там, где-то за океаном, за тысячами километров, где рядом близко тебе человек. Ты не можешь побачити, когда ты захочешь сегодня или завтра. Ты вообще не можешь видеть много лет. То такое ощущение боли, страдания. Что ты сидишь, смотришь на фотографии, то ты уже даже плакать не можешь. Не можешь. Ты только думаешь, что уже ты не подорослешала, чтобы побачить ее где-то, обнять хочется. Это очень тяжело. После смерти моей мамы мою сестру забрали сначала до лекарни, но в школу уже ее не принимали, потому что сейчас ну, нет такой. Сейчас дитину в семью треба. Старайся, молодец! Жимочка нашлась, она с Кривого Рога, очень хорошо, знаешь, и она запропонувала взять Ирину под опеку. Молодец! Поехали! И тогда, когда я увидела ее, я была просто like, в любви, like, для первого first, first секунды. Это было как like, бум! Она выглядела как я в начале. Ничего, мы сейчас все соберем и заново сделаем, Мариш. Then I saw Vika and I was kind of maybe that's right to take them both, but how can I afford it financially? How can I do it? Vika is already grown up. Family feeling was so strong inside her, you know? That's what I said, Vika, you always have to keep this feeling, like family feeling. You, you have to always fight for your family, whatever is left. And then I told her, Vika, don't worry, you're gonna be in touch. We're always gonna be in touch. I Это вообще класс. Очень красиво. Молодец. Главное, что ты похожа на себя, и Вика похожа на себя. Вика, ну как что, что, что хочешь ты написать? Я по тебе скучаю. Я по тебе скучаю, очень хорошо. Очень. Сердечки. Все, отлично. Послание Вики соорудили быстренько. Фотографии отсюда. Это мой последний рік. Для меня это очень тяжкий период. Это уже будет близко, знаешь, до біля последнего звонника, то я буду уже понимать, что нужно собирать вещи, потому что тебе ну, уже тут не будут принимать как родную. Тебе выставляют за дверь и скажут, иди в доросле жизнь. У меня 
та, знаєш, закінчити університет, поїхати до своєї сестри в майбутньому, знайти роботу, бути комусь потрібною, знайти, може, знаєш, там, сім'ю, що в мене була, моя сім'я, ну, знайти себе взагалі. Я раніше думала, що я зробила погано, там, що я відпустила Ріну так далеко, за, ну, ну, в Канаду, за кордон. І я думала, що я така погана сестра, як я могла так чинити, але я думаю, краще жити в сім'ї, а тим паче це за кордоном. Вона багато чого вміє зараз, вона вже багато де була, вона відпочиває на різних морях. Там, і в неї багато друзів, вона вивчила іншу мову, з нею буде, я думаю, гарна людина. Єлоу снефер. Черепаха! Яка большая, розміром чи я? Смотрите, зуби, зуби, зуби! О, акула, зуби! She now she can swim, she can skate, she can ski, she can rollerblade. She has birthday parties like, you know, it's like in American Wonderland. Can you imagine? Like, she could could she have anything, anything like that in Ukraine? But it's it's all material thing. The main thing she has family. Дальше. Все, что ты захочешь делать дальше, ты имеешь рядом маму, папу, бабушку и Андрюшу. И это, наверное, самое большое и ценное счастье в твоей жизни. Да, Мас? И сейчас мы еще Вике позвоним. Привет. Всего самого лучшего. Хочу, чтобы ты хорошо закончила школу. Слушай маму и папу, хорошо? Да. Now, there have been a couple of developments since that documentary was completed. In May, there was this. So Vika was granted a short-term visa to come to Canada when the film premiered at Toronto's Hot Docs, and she was reunited with her little sister. After sharing her story with the world, Vika says it's like a weight has been lifted off her shoulders. But I will say that reunion was temporary. Vika has since gone back to Ukraine and is studying to be a hairdresser. She dreams of coming back on a permanent basis. To watch the full, longer version of Vika, head on over to cbc.ca slash short docs. There you'll also find more documentaries by emerging filmmakers from right across Canada. And still ahead on The National, people with O negative blood know they're in high demand from Canadian blood services. I have O negative blood. They call me when they have a shortage. I come. 
<laughs> but new research means that guy might get a break in a few years. How scientists are figuring out how to change blood cells. Coming up. Tonight on The National, a police update in a dramatic abduction caught on video north of Toronto. They say tips from the public help them to locate the 28-year-old woman. She's safe and in good health, they say. They also believe they've identified the suspect. They say 27-year-old Jonathan McLennan should be considered armed and dangerous. He's still out there. Final preparations underway in Dublin today, ahead of this weekend's visit by Pope Francis. It's the first papal visit to Ireland in nearly 40 years, but reception this time around is expected to be cool. Not only has the church's influence in Ireland waned, but there is anger over the Vatican's handling of sex abuse scandals. Dr. Frieden, anything you want to sure. say? And one of the top U.S. public health experts was in handcuffs today after being charged with sexual abuse. Thomas Frieden, the former director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, is accused by a woman of grabbing her without permission. He did not enter pleas today on his three charges, forcible touching, sex abuse and harassment. Well, let's turn to an ever-present need across this country. Last week, Canadian Blood Services put out an urgent call for blood donations, especially from those who are type O negative, since in an emergency, theirs is compatible with all others. Well, this week, researchers in B.C. announced they could be one step closer to helping make all blood universal. Christine Burak explains just how they might do it. Would you happen to know what blood type you are? Uh, B plus. B positive. Yes. It's definitely in you to give, but if you need blood, it has to be the right type. Otherwise, your body will reject it. Do you know what blood type you are? Yeah, O positive. Most people are. O is considered universal blood. It can be given to virtually anyone, so it's often in a short supply. But Canadian scientists think they've found a way to efficiently convert other blood types into O. People are surprised because it sounds odd. They think that we're changing the blood type of an individual, which would be a lot more scary. But we're only changing the type of the blood that's been taken from that individual. Different blood types have different sugars stuck to the outside of their cells, except O. So scientists have isolated specialized enzymes found in our gut bacteria and use them to eat the sugars off the surface of non-O blood cells, essentially transforming them into type O. They've tried this before with similar enzymes, but those work too slowly, making the process too expensive. When we did a side-by-side -side test of the uh, already existing best candidate, along with ours, using, uh, using the two of them side-by-side, -side, we found that ours worked 30 times faster. The cells are, are starting to clump on the, on the left-hand side. So that's a blood type A. At Canadian Blood Services, the goal is to save lives. Scientists here are excited at the prospect of having more universal blood. This is where, where modern science is taking us in, in transfusion medicine and blood products, is actually we now understand enough about these cells to be able to, to make the blood product better for patients to get a better transfusion outcome. While it wouldn't eliminate the need for donated blood, doctors and paramedics would no longer need to match donors with patients in emergency situations, which would undoubtedly save lives. But scientists say they're not there yet. I think it's great if it actually comes to fruition, but you know, at this point, I have O negative blood. They call me when they have a shortage. I come. Researchers still need to conduct clinical trials, but say blood conversion could become a reality in as little as five years. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Now, we have an update on that recent appeal from Canadian Blood Services. It seems to have been quite successful. The target was 22,000 donations by this Sunday, ahead of the Labor Day weekend. And they say Canadians have generously answered that call, and they're now just 1,500 donors away from reaching the goal. Next on The National, the electric car designed by Kalashnikov. Chris Brown will take us to the showroom floor. And don't forget, The National Today takes you inside our journalism every afternoon. That's our newsletter going deeper on the top stories and, hey, highlighting the stories you may have missed. Today, Mike Pence's plan to put man on the moon again and stay there, breaking down the U.S.'s plan for a moon base. 
subscribe to our newsletter at cbcnews.ca slash The National. sleek and very fast Tesla Roadster. The electric sports car is said to be capable of going from zero to 100 in less than two seconds. Elon Musk's dream that his company's cars would fill North American roads. But at the other end of the electric car spectrum, there's a very different vision. Nowhere near as sleek as the Tesla, nowhere near as fast, but with a rather menacing pedigree. That's because it's made by the same company behind one of the world's most notorious and ubiquitous weapons. But as Chris Brown explains, they're not just about guns anymore. Well, you're looking at people taking aim and pulling the trigger on AK-47 assault rifles. We're at uh, Russia's largest military trade fair, and we're gonna show you what's actually the, the biggest thing making news at this year's show. And it's, it's not actually even a weapon, it's this, this pale blue car. It's called the CV-1 and it's Russia's first entry in the electric car race. Uh, we don't know much about it in terms of how much it's going to cost. They're not saying, but we're only told that it will go 300 kilometers on one charge and it will go from zero to 100 in about six seconds. Now, one of the things that makes this car so interesting is who makes it and that is it's the same people that make those assault rifles the legendary Russian arms manufacturer Kalashnikov now they've been branching out over the years they're not just about guns anymore they're also making uh, sporting equipment camping equipment uh, all kinds of uh, other vehicles and now also cars reaction from Russians to this new entry has been a little bit mixed some people like the kind of retro Soviet design Others on social media are saying you got to stick to what you do best, and that's uh, and that's make uh, make guns. Also interesting, some of the marketing on this really going on that this is the thing that's going to take down Tesla. This can beat Tesla's electric car. Lots of hyperbole for now. Obviously, they're brand new uh, at all of this. Don't expect to be able to buy one of these in Canada anytime soon, though. Kalashnikov is on a long list of Russian entities that have been sanctioned by the Canadian government uh, because of um, the very frosty relations with the Putin government. Chris Brown, CBC News in Moscow. Okay, next on The National, our moment of the day in which a dedicated BBC radio reporter keeps calm and carries on despite getting tangled up in the story, literally. The latest forecast suggests the eye will skirt the big island in around 12 hours' time before brushing past Maui on its way to Oahu. Oh. But first, before TMZ, Perez, Hilton and Gawker, there was Robin Leach. The British gossip guru died today in Las Vegas at the age of 76. But in the 1980s, it was his show and that voice that crystallized the opulence of celebrity life. You're cordially invited for a regal tour of exotic Malaysia with gorgeous Morgan Brittany on our next VIP edition. The London-born Leach began his career in newspapers and after moving to the U.S. in the 60s, joined the fledgling CNN and the team that launched Entertainment Tonight. <laughs> Lifestyles of the rich and famous evolved from that. Every week, for more than a decade, Leach would give frenzied descriptions of yachts, mansions and private jets. The more outrageous, the better. We take you right up the front drive, and then we kick the front door open, and we say, and this is a million-dollar lobby. The host became as rich and as famous as the people he interviewed. Vroom, vroom. He also wasn't above poking fun at himself, as he did for Bill Nye, the science guy. Welcome to another edition of Lifestyles of the Large and Extinct. Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous ended in 1995, but... His sign-off phrase lives on as a cultural touchstone. Lip Robin Leach with champagne wishes and caviar dreams. When a hurricane hits, most people take cover. But journalists, we try to get out there. 
That's certainly what BBC North America correspondent James Cook did when he was covering Hurricane Lane. You know the saying, if, if a tree falls in a forest and no one's around to hear it, does it make a sound? Well, you're about to hear what happens when that tree falls and a radio reporter is around. Just listen to our moment of the day. The latest forecast suggests the eye will skirt the big island in around 12 hours' time before brushing past Maui on its way to Oahu. I'm all right. Yeah. I'm fine. Well, that was unexpected. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. Sure. Yeah, yeah, I'm good. Yeah, I'm all right. Don't, don't, don't move it. Don't move it. I'll be easier just to climb out. Okay, Stand by. Right. Yeah, thank you. Oh, it smashed my laptop. So, uh, <laughs> the laptop aside, it's, it seems like he was okay in the end. And, and boy, let it never be said that journalism is not an exciting profession. And now I'm going to be uh, looking up at the studio lights and the girders above me, hoping that it doesn't all come crashing down. It can be exciting here in the studio as well. Thanks for joining us here on the program. That's National for this Friday, August 24th. I hope you have a great weekend. Thanks for joining us. Good night.